Welcome to this Handy Houdini Tips video. In this one, we're continuing from where we left off in the last one, and we're going over animated instancing. In the last part, we basically went over how to create instances inside of Karma that have some good variation. And so we used the instancer node inside of Solaris to help us generate that. We also used the index attribute, which allowed us to switch between species of trees. Now in this one, I'm going to show you how to take a flower. Now this could be anything. You could have some crystals or whatever it is, and I'm going to have it sort of die over time. So an animated version of a flower dying and then instancing that over a bunch of points and then offsetting those animations based on an attribute. So let's get into that. We're going to be going straight into Houdini. Now, because this one's main focus is on variants and creating a system that can create variants to be used as animated instancing, we're going to not focus too much on the stuff, but I am going to quickly go over what I have here. So I have this flower geometry. This is an asset from Quixel. So as you can see, it's just this flower over here. And this is a nice little trick if you want to have an effect where foliage is dying, or even if you reverse it, it can be like the foliage is growing. So in this case, what I did was I converted this to a VDB. So just VDB from particles, you smooth the surface, basically just trying to get yourself a nice sort of representation of the flower in a VDB form. We can then take that and create an anchor group. So anything below a certain point is now our anchor group. Put that into a vellum cloth, generate some vellum struts, play around with the stiffness of this a bit until you're happy with it. And then we're going to pin those base points to the ground. We can run that through a vellum solver right over here. And then what you're going to do is decrease the time scale and increase the velocity damping. What that allows is this sort of thing where this collapses over time. And what I've done before when using this is also adjusting the rest length so that it sort of collapses in on itself. Um, that results in quite a nice effect. And then you just take that and you use a pointy form on the original flowers and you end up with something like this. So it's a very organic looking decay. And you can also use this in reverse and have these kind of grow. Now, the sequence that I've created is 120 frames. That's going to be important later. The length of your animation is going to have a huge effect on the animated instancing that we create at the end. Because let's say that we have five frames of animation, right? However, we have a sequence that runs over 120 frames. What's going to happen is if you take your animation and kind of spread it over that 120 frames, it's going to be completely jittery. It's going to only move once every however many frames because you only have five frames to work with. So generally what I try to aim for is having more animation frames than the total sequence length. So in this case, I have 120 animation frames. So I'll feel free to use anything less than 120 in the final sequence. Okay, so that's all I have over here, right? This animated flower that just collapses. If we go up a level, we have some instancing points and there's nothing particularly interesting going on here except for the last node. So we have this grid where I generate a noise pattern and then scatter and align some points, just like that. This over here, I'm just adjusting the P scale to set it to one so that every flower has a uniform scale of one. And then I add this attribute called intensity. So this intensity attribute, if we visualize it over here, it's just an attribute that I've kind of keyframed. It can be any arbitrary attribute. So if you have an infection solver and you have a bunch of points that are being infected, then those points that you are infecting, they can be this intensity attribute. It can be named whatever you want. It is just an arbitrary attribute that ranges between zero and one. It is important that it ranges between zero and one and that it sort of moves along between zero and one in a very linear fashion. So as you can see, all of these points have a random value to start with and they all move towards a value of one at frame 72. Now, this is where it gets interesting. So this attribute wrangle is currently blank but I'm going to show you the kind of code that I want to generate in here. The idea, firstly, is that instead of having species, so as we had before, we had species, right? We had species one, species two, and we used our instancer to say, okay, if the index is this, then make it species one. If the index value is this, then make it species two and so on. And we could have as many species as we want. Now, if we take that same sort of concept and instead of having species, we have frame numbers, then perhaps you can start to see how we can use that for animation, right? So what we're instancing is dependent on a particular attribute. So instead of saying, okay, this index value relates to the species, we're now saying this index value relates to this frame. So in here, we're going to create that index value. Firstly, we're going to start 
with int index. We're going to make that equal to an integer. So we're going to first cast to int. So this means that anything that goes inside of these brackets is going to be an integer. We're then going to round to int our intensity attribute. So this is that value that ranges between zero and one. And we're going to multiply this intensity attribute by the number of frames that we have in our animation. So we can just say times chf or chi rather. And then in here, we can just say frames. And if we want to clean this up, what we can actually do is take this out of the brackets over here. So instead of doing this ch frames over here, we can take this entire thing out and put it into another variable called int anim underscore frames. We can make this equal to that chi frames. And then over here, we can just say multiply by anim underscore frames. So all we're doing is we're saying, take our intensity attribute, multiply it by the number of frames that we have in our animation, and then round that value to an integer. So if we just create our spare parameter over here, and we say that we have 120 frames to work with, which is what we have in that flower animation, here we can actually add an attribute to test this. We can just say at test equals index. And if we go over to our geometry spreadsheet over here, and we go over to our test attribute, what we should notice is that it starts out with these random values, right? So this is actually representing our frame number. And then as we progress and our intensity gets closer to one, all of these values tick up towards 120, right? The final frame of our animation. So in theory, what we're saying is, okay, as our intensity increases, move the frames along, right? So proceed with the animation. Now, this is still very kind of arbitrary and we're not really doing anything with it, but we will be using it soon. So the other thing that we're going to do is we're just going to say index equals clamp. So with this clamp, we want to make sure that it doesn't leave a particular range. So we're just going to say clamp, and then we're going to take our index and we're going to clamp it between frame one, because remember there is no frame zero. So we're saying one as the first frame, and then we're going to use 119 as the last. Or alternatively, we can do anim underscore frames minus one. So the total minus one frame. So now we have this index variable and it ranges between one and 119. So we can use that for our animation. However, we need it as an attribute that can be used in our instancer. So we're going to make an attribute called name. Now this is one of the ways that we can use our instancer. You can use the index or you can use the name attribute. There's a bunch of different things that you can use. We're going to say at name equals, and then we're going to give this a name. So this is going to make sense later. But over here, we're going to say variant underscore outside of these inverted commas, we're just going to say plus itoa. So this is an integer to string and we're going to take our index. So right over there. So if we go over to our geometry spreadsheet, you can see over here that our name over here changes over time. So as you can see, there's variant one. And as it increases, we move it along. This is useful because what we can now do is we can go to our Solaris level and define which frame should be shown by using this name attribute. Okay, so this might not make perfect sense right now, but once we're at the Solaris level, I think things will start to fall into place. So the first thing that we need to do is go to our stage level. All right, so at the stage level, we're going to begin by creating a subnetwork. We're just going to be putting a bunch of stuff in here, so that's why we have it as a single subnet. We can call this a variant generator. And in here, what we're going to be doing is creating a little system that can take our animated geometry, so our flower that ranges from frame one to 120. And what it's going to do is it's going to create a single USD file that has each and every one of those frames of that animation stored inside of it as a variant. This workflow is something that I've been using and it works pretty well. I'm not certain if it is the only workflow or the correct workflow. My general view is that if it works, it's correct. So this does work. You can use it for animated instancing. Um, but if there are other ways of doing it, I am interested in knowing. So what we're going to start off with is a for each. So this for each block over here that we're creating is a little bit different to the SOP level for each. So as you can see over here, we have the iteration option name, iteration count option. So all of these are slightly different from what you may be used to seeing. So currently we have the iterations set to one. So it's just going to run once and that's fine for now. So we don't need to change anything just yet in this. Inside of here, we're going to add a SOP import, and this is where we want to add our flower. So over here, we can go over to the SOP path, and we're going to go to the flower, animated flower. So that's just gonna bring in our flower. Now it's going to bring it in at whatever frame our timeline is currently on. And that's not really what we want. What we want is for this to freeze on a particular frame that's dependent on the iteration of this for each. So what we want to do is for it to loop through every frame store each frame as a variant. 
right? So we don't want it to be timeline based. We want it to just be based on the number of iterations that our for each is running through. So to do that, we can add a time shift node. So we add a time shift node after the sub import right over here. And as you can see, we have this method by frame and by default, it changes per frame. If we click on it, it's just $F. So we can actually change this if we delete the channels. We can put in something that you might not have seen before because it is Solaris specific. In here, we can say context option right over there. And inside of here, we'll say iteration. So now this frame should be equal to the iteration of our for each loop, right? And this is actually fetched from this over here, this iteration option name. And we use this context option function to call that iteration. So it's almost like a detail attribute. Similar to how we have the iteration detail when we're working with four loops inside of SOPS, we have this context option iteration inside of Solaris. So now you can see that this doesn't change depending on our timeline, it changes depending on the current iteration. All right, now that our for each freezes each frame, what we can do is start setting up the import. So we have the SOPS import node, which is bringing in our animated flower but we need to give it a path prefix. So I'm going to switch this to the Solaris desktop just so that we can see what we're creating over here. So this sub import over here, we'll just call it flower, but we'll also add the current iteration that we're on. So to do that, we're going to use the back tick. So back tick on most keyboards is next to number one in the top left. So we're going to add a back tick. And what this does is it says that, okay, this isn't a string, this is a piece of code. So we're saying, okay, anything inside of the two back ticks that's a piece of code. So we're just going to say context option as we've done before. And again, we're just going to choose the iteration, all caps iteration, and then back tick to close that off. All right, so if we take a look at the bottom left over here, we now have flower zero. As it runs through iterations, we should have flower zero, one, two, three, and so on. Now we can already test this. If we go over to the end block of our for each and we increase the iterations to something like five, what you'll notice is that it generates a bunch of flowers, right? Zero to five at the bottom over there. However, they're individual and we don't want them as individual flowers. We want them as a single flower with a bunch of variants of that flower inside of it. So to do that, we're going to have to use the variant node. So we're going to set this back to just one iteration and go ahead and drop down a variant node. So we're going to use the add variants to new primitive and we're going to just plug this into the second input. So our time shift is going into the second input. So in here, the primitive path is just going to be flower. That's where we're going to be putting our variants. And the variant set, we're just going to call variant. Now, the variant source primitive is going to be that flower that we just created, which is called flower with the context option iteration. So backtick, context, option, open brackets, iteration, backtick to close it, right? So we're now saying, okay, fetch that as the source primitive. And this variant's default name should be backtick. So we're going to be using the context again. So context option, iteration. So that will just make our variant number equal to the current iteration. Once we have that, we can try increasing our iterations to something like 10. And it will start to take a little while because what it's doing is it's bringing in the geometry for each frame and it's creating a variant. So the more frames that we have, the longer this will take, but it shouldn't take very long at all. Once we have that, we can try and explore variants after this node over here just to see if this works. We're just going to be looking in forward slash flower. And there we go. We have 10 of our variants created just like that. And if we reduce the spacing, you'll notice that there's a bit of an overlap. And what's happening there is that those are the different frames of our animation. So those are the first 10 frames. If we increase this to, let's just say 20, it'll now do 20 variants and it'll be the first 20 frames of our animation. There we go. So as you can see, it's now storing those 20 frames as variants. And when we use this explore variants node, we can now see them. So obviously this works as is, but what we want is for this to be based on the number of frames that we have. So we're just going to set our iterations to 120 because that's the number of frames that we have. And that's just going to take a little while. So once that's done, we can explore the variants. And as you can see, that is every frame of our animation stored as a variant. What we can do from here is just plug this into the output of our subnetwork. And we're actually going to leave this explore variants because when we have it like this, we're just viewing a single primitive and we're not viewing a particular variant of it. In fact, we're viewing the last variant that is added to it. So that's all that's being displayed there. What we want is every variant. And then we can use this for instancing. So if we now go up a level, we have our variant generator. And we can then go ahead and do things like materials. So I'm going to just add a material library over here. And this is just the material library for the flowers. So as you can see, I've now applied it inside of here. It's just a material X shader where I'm applying this material to these flowers. 
From here, we can create a collection as we've done before. So in the last part, I showed you how to create a collection. Again, we're going to be creating a new collection over here of all of our variants. So right over here, we can just give this collection name a name of flower underscore collection. Now, what you'll notice is that our primitive path is going to be a bit strange because we have explore variants one and inside of that we have flower. So what we can rather do is go back up here and in this explore variants, we don't have to do dollar OS over here. We can do something like flower variants. So we now have flower variants and inside of that we have flower and inside of that we have each variant. All right, so in our collection, all we have to do is do forward slash flower underscore variants forward slash flower forward slash asterisk. That takes everything inside of that and adds it to a collection. Okay, once we have that, we can do a USD ROP node. And what this will allow is for us to save this out. So we can actually just save this out as animated underscore flower dot USD. And if we save this to disk, so we can now bring those flowers back in from where we've saved them. So we can drop a file node and it's going to ask us how we would like to bring it in. We'll say sublayer. We're going to go ahead and find that file location. Inside of Geo, you'll find animatedflower.usdnc. That's for non-commercial. Um, by default, that actually doesn't show up because it has a filter for show files matching. So just clear that out and your usdnc file will show up. Accept that over there. And as you can see, that's now being imported. So we're now bringing it in. And then we can use it in an instancer as we've done before. So into the second input right over there, the target points will be an external SOP. And we're going to go ahead and choose our instance points. And by default, it's going to put all of these everywhere. And we don't want every variant. We want this dependent on that name attribute that we created. So we're firstly going to have to define our prototype primitives with a percentage sign, flower underscore collection, just like that. And then expanding the options, we're going to go ahead and use the name attribute called name. And what we're going to need to do is just disable only copy specified prototype primitives. Once you've done that, you'll notice that our flowers are now being brought in. And if we play this back, you'll notice that they are animated. So this is based on that intensity that we created. So over here, this value that we've created up here, if we just visualize it, is what's driving our animation. So as it goes from zero to one, our animation proceeds from frame one to frame 120. If we take a look at this, that's exactly what's happening over here. And from here, you can just very easily render this out. I'm going to add an environment light right over here. And if we give this a quick comma render, there we have it. We have all of our flowers being brought in. They all have their materials. And if you've made this with a material X shader, you can very easily render this with comma XPU as well. So just add that comma render settings node, switching it to comma XPU. And just like that, you have all of your flowers over here being brought in and they're all animated. You can render this out. You can do this with a bunch of different flowers. Now, the nice thing about this is that you can create multiple versions of this. So you could very easily just copy this over and have another flower system being generated through this, or you can automate it even more and put it into a tops network where you have flower animations being fed in and it automatically generates all of the USD files for you. And then you can use them in your instancer. If you want a smoother animation, remember to use more frames so that it works as sort of sub steps. And yeah, this is how you would go about doing it inside of Solaris. So I hope that you liked this video. I hope that it wasn't too complicated. Um, if there are any issues, please let me know down in the comments if you are confused by anything or you can join our Discord and I can have a bit more of an in-depth discussion with you there. So yeah, I hope that you found this useful. I'll be seeing you next time. Thank you for watching. Bye.